Good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you for being here. My name is Andy Rich. I'm the head of the Truman Scholarship Foundation, and um, I appreciate you coming out uh, this afternoon. It, we're all sort of, I think, bleary-eyed uh, following the election and uh, uh, spent an awful lot of it last night and this morning kind of following election results. And so it's to your credit that you're here as we switch topics in some sense, but, but it's the topic to which I think many of us now uh, turn quickly which is a topic of governance. Um, now with the elections done, we look back at how well this town can make decisions um, and search for better systems for governance or, or better methods um, of governance. Um, we've got a lot of problems in uh, Washington and in Congress in particular. Um, we've got institutional problems, we've got electoral problems, we have political problems. But we, we also have problems that um, we talk about often with respect to information, about um, the quality of information, both uh, the, qual the, the abundance of information, the purpose of information, and how effectively information and expertise actually reaches decision making or is useful in the governance process. And, and so that is what um, we're here to discuss today for a panel entitled Information Overload, How Elected Leaders Find Expert Knowledge in the Internet Era. And we're gonna hear from three folks who are um, not just thinking about these subjects, but are actually doing something to try to improve not just the quality of information and expertise that is available to decision-making and to governance, um, but also to improve the systems by which expertise and experts themselves reach decision makers. So we're gonna hear and we'll hear in order from Gary Van Landingham, who's the director of a project called Results First at the Pew Center on the States, from Lorelei Kelly, who is the leader of the project here at the New America Foundation called Smart Congress, and from Ben Freakley, who is a special advisor to the president of the School of Public Affairs at Arizona State, um, and we'll talk about a project that they have launched called Decision Theater. Um, and so if you don't mind, first off, if everybody can turn off their electronic devices, those that make noise at least, um, and prepare to be engaged in the discussion. We're, each of them is gonna speak for five, seven minutes, um, and then we wanna open it up for your questions, comments, and really get it into a, a conversation. And so um, with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Gary. Thank you, and I, I welcome the opportunity to, to come and share the work that the Pew Center is doing on this issue. And, and I, I love that the topic that we're talking about, information overload, because I, I think that we have to recognize that we are living in a knowledge, in a information-rich but knowledge-poor environment, meaning that there's a lot of facts out there. Uh, but I'm someone who actually believes that, that facts exist and we're not totally in a postmodern world. But, but the question is, with all, that is, with all that information, with all that stuff out there, how do we really package that and really find the nuggets in, in all of the, the ore that's out there and make that information available to policymakers and to do so in a way that is actually useful to them and hopefully compelling to them? And I think we have to recognize that there, are, there is a lot of information out there. Uh, you know, if you walk the halls of Congress, if you walk the halls of any legislature, you're not seeing a lot of members sitting around saying, there's a problem here and I can't find anybody who would tell me what I should do about it. I mean, that there are thousands of folks just one block over on K Street who make a good living, you know, providing information to, to policymakers. The question is, we recognize that a lot of that information isn't particularly good. Uh, there's a lot of research out there that isn't particularly good, but how do we find and package the information that is really good, that really can help inform the policy debates and to really help us move forward in a way that, that captures the knowledge that we have in a way that really helps us make better decisions? Because I think that really is the, the, the challenge we have in front of us. We, we certainly face daunting challenges uh, as a nation, as a state. Uh, my work focuses on state governments. Uh, we all know about the, the federal budget deficits that, that are out there. States ha under the Great Recession have faced a, a, a equally daunting set of challenges since the Great Recession ended. Uh, states have cut about half of a trillion dollars out of their budgets, and when you consider the size of state budgets, collectively half a trillion dollars is a lot of money from, from states. Uh, my home state of Florida is now around 22% lower in revenues coming in for the general fund than it was in 2006. That sort of shows the depths of the challenges that, that states are, are facing. 
So we, the question you know, for us is we can either sort of try to cut our way out of this or, or to try to make better choices to, to, to get our way out of this. And I think that we really have an opportunity to make better choices, not necessarily just to, to cut for the sake of cutting. Uh, that the challenge with cutting things is policymakers don't have good information on what, what programs they're actually operating. No state has a comprehensive list of all the programs they're operating. They don't have information on how well all those programs are operating. So a rational choice for a policymaker is to cut across the board and hope maybe the agencies can figure it out and, and can cut stuff that needs to be cut because they simply don't know it. Well, the challenge with that is we end up in a situation where we cut everything and nothing works because we've so under-resourced everything that nothing can possibly function the way we want it to. And we, we, the, the challenges facing the country are too severe to be able to, to, to cope with that. We really start need to start making better triage decisions, identifying what really works out there, putting our resources towards that, and then you know, stopping doing things that don't work. Now that sounds great. The challenge, of course, is what are those things that work well and what are the things that don't work well and you know, how can I really help make those choices more compelling to policymakers? And, and the good news situation that we're in is that a huge amount of really good research has been done across this country and in other nations really over the last 20 or 30 years. A lot of really great evaluations have been done that have used very strong research designs to uh, identify collectively sort of what we think, what, what we know actually various different types of programs can accomplish. And for example, certain programs, say in criminal justice, have been evaluated extensively all across the country. Drug courts have been evaluated in almost every state. Uh, different sentencing options are, 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 are well researched. A lot of educational programs are well researched. So if you take all that information and you can put it all together, collectively we actually know quite a bit about what works. The challenge for policymakers is they don't have time to weed through all that information. Um, so what we are doing results first is doing that for them and, and making it very readily accessible to them. Our research partners at this point have read through well over 27,000 evaluations, of casting aside probably 90% of them, which just aren't really good research designs, but then have used the, the you know, statistical analysis techniques to say, based on our collective knowledge of what we know, here's what we expect a program like this to be able to accomplish if implemented correctly in a state. And then we go the next step and say, based on your state, your state's characteristics, the people that you're serving, the cost of providing these services in your state. We can not only give them information on what the policy choices will be, but also a very comprehensive cost-benefit analysis of each different program option that's available to them. What this really allows us to do is what we call sort of a consumer's guide to governance, uh, saying that, yo, you want to do something about crime in your in your communities. Uh, here is a menu of proven interventions which would be effective uh, based on all the best research if you did them in your state. And here is a precise estimate of what would happen if you implemented each of these and you can compare the results of them. And the great news is we can do that now. Uh, we can do this in a way that it has never been able to done before. And it's something that really is compelling to policymakers because it allows them to say on an apples to apples comparison, if I do this option, here's where I will get. If I go down this road, here's where I will be. And here's the comparative return on investment that I will get from different options. The same type of analysis that we all ideally want to be able to do when investing our 401ks and other things, we can now start to do on the policy side. And this can be tr truly transformative to states. My initiative at the Pew Center on the States is about a year and a half old. And, and for the last you know, year and a half, we've been going out and talking to states and saying, are you interested in joining with us to put this type of a, pro a process in place in your state? Uh, to date, we are working with 12 states who are working on this process. Uh, we provide them the software necessary to do this, technical assistance to be able to, to implement this approach in their, in their jurisdictions. Uh, support to help them not only get this operational, but also to link the results to policymakers in a, in a way that we think is compelling, uh, and hopefully do good things with the results. Uh, it, this is still a preliminary exercise in most states, but we think that the early results are pretty encouraging. Uh, the 12 states that we are, are working with, we think 10 of them will have the initial components of this model operational in time for the 2013 sessions. Two of them have completed it and have uh, released reports based on it, uh, Iowa and New Mexico. And those states have already started moving money from things that this approach showed that were ineffective to, th to things that really represent better investments for, for the citizens. 
And we are confident that as the other states move into their legislative sessions, where really the big money appropriations are made, that this will continue to, to gain traction. Uh, and we're hoping that all of these states will have the success that the Washington state has achieved through this process over the last 15 years. This is an approach that was pioneered in Washington state uh, by a research uh, institute there, the Washington State Institute for Public Policy, which is a, a fairly small research institute. But in, in the mid-90s, the legislature started asking them a question, a uh, basically fundamental question. We're concerned about crime in Washington state because Washington state, like most states, was seeing crime as, as a big problem in the 90s. And the legislature really wanted to know what are our options in moving forward in doing this? And the Institute came, came back in about a year and said, here's what the research shows, here's what really are good proven interventions that we think would work in Washington State. And the legislature said, can you give us very precise estimates of how much money we'd have to put into each of these programs to achieve the outcomes that, that you say we would get? And what it would really mean on the ground if we did that? So they started developing this cost-benefit analysis model, which is a software component. Uh, and they've been using this now for about 15 years to really make a series of incremental decisions, moving money away from things that this approach shows are relatively ineffective, to programs that it shows to be much more effective in terms of getting long-term uh, outcomes for citizens. Uh, since that time period, looking back, they're estimating now they're saving about a billion three per biennium, uh, which in Washington state is a lot of money in their budget. Their crime rate is substantially lower than national average. It's fallen faster and deeper than other states. Uh, the reincarceration rate is lower than other states. So they're, they're really achieving the outcome that we want states to have, which is they're a safer society and they're spending less money to do it. And they're not just locking up everybody and throwing away the key because that can be effective, but it's pretty expensive. We think this is an approach that, that we can continue to develop into more and more areas that have that robust research base. And the good news, again, is that there's a lot of areas that have that robust research base. The challenge, again, is getting that information to policymakers, getting it into something that they can trust, and giving it to them in a way that can be very useful in the policy and budget processes. Um, we are confident that, that we're on the right approach to this. It will take years to really implement this in, in, in states. There are areas that are, are big issues for the nation, which the research base simply isn't there yet. So, you know, as, as a country moving forward, we know there's areas that we're going to have to invest money into to learn what works. But in a lot of areas, we have that knowledge. And the question is just, how do we get that information to policymakers in a compelling way? And I think this is a way that we can move beyond all the information we have out there to, to knowledge that can be used. And I'll leave this off at, at this. Great. Thank you. I'll go up there as well. Um, thank you all for coming today. I know this is, uh, people are nursing one kind of hangover or another, either one of joy or one of misery. <laughs> so I appreciate that you came out today. Um, my name is Lorelai Kelly. I am leading a project here at New America Foundation at the Open Technology Institute called Smart Congress. And it's uh, not a contradiction in terms. It doesn't have to be, although maybe it has appeared that it hasn't acted in the best uh, intelligent fashion over the last number of years. I'll, I think the easiest way for me to introduce my project is just to say how it started. I was asked um, two and a half years ago to by a group of uh, philanthropists to go up to Capitol Hill, where I worked for nine years on global security issues as a shared staff person. So I helped both Democrats and Republicans on post-Cold War security. Um, and it was obvious at that time just that the institution itself is pretty much an antique. It really still looks at the world where national security is concerned, like World War II just ended, like it's 1948. Uh, it's, it's much more uh, capable of, of watching for Napoleon to cross uh, Prussia than it is to deal with complex, messy, interdependent kinds of threats that we're dealing with today. And one of the things they kept noticing is that their advocacy strategies just weren't working. And so they asked me to, to develop an interview agenda to go up and just talk to staff person after staff person on committees and on personal staffs to say, what kind of information do you need? What can we do for you? And so I went to interview after interview, talking to staff, and they are all across the board uh, extremely frustrated at their situation, sometimes feeling demoralized, very conscious of the fact that the institution that they work in is, has such low um, regard in the public's eye, uh, and uh, it became obvious to me that we were dealing not with just a sort of an institutional obsolescence problem. It's built-in filters on the world and lenses on the world are, if not old, then often looking backward. Um, but also, it, it's, it's suffering through an information overload. 
And an in interesting piece here, when you also, again, look just as an institution, what I'm trying to do is develop empathy for the institution of Congress, because we do all have it in common. Uh, whether we uh, like the left or the right, the Tea Party or the progressive Democrats, everybody needs to work within this institution that we have. And it's really a fine one that has endured many uh, trials over the uh, decades and centuries, but it um, really needs a special kind of help right now. And, and another uh, thing that became very obvious to me on Capitol Hill is that despite all these new transparency rules, which are kind of bureaucratic and inside baseball, uh, that has busted open even more the amount of information that's incoming. And the gatekeepers of the information in Congress, has anybody here worked on the Hill, are um, about 25, and the end users are often between 65 and 75. And so they're just, they're just not going to use the electronics. Uh, they're not familiar with it, there are strange uh, rules that forbid electronics in some places and not others. Every office I talked to said their member still requires a hard copy in 14-point type on everything. Uh, I went to an event the other day, and this is probably an exaggeration, where somebody said, um, hey, we think it's a technological innovation in our office when the member uses the tab key instead of five spaces. Uh, so this is, what <laughs> this is what we're dealing with. And so what I'd like to say, first of all, is uh, if we can have empathy for this institution, because it is a, a wonderful institution and it really needs a special kind of intervention and help right now. So the, uh, this issue of knowledge and information, uh, it was obvious also when talking to staff is that they know that not all information is created equally. But the high quality information is not available to them in a way that they can use it. And what's also, you know, when we move into the political world, a uh, social capital, which is something we've been hearing a lot about in um, discussions lately with the millennial generation and also just uh, globalization and new media, is uh, the people sometimes with the best and the highest quality social capital, meaning uh, interests that are based on common goods and public interests, uh, often spend it terribly. They're, they, they have great... Um, they have great relationships and they have great expertise, but terrible timing. So I thought, well, that might be something that transparency rules can help out with because, for example, you can be in the room in a hearing now in almost every committee hearing except for the appropriations committees now. They're doing real-time webcasting, and this, again, is all changing. So how, what do we do with this transparency? Because the other piece of this, and, and I think this is really significant and important, is that I feel like the uh, transparency movement, for lack of a better word, this uh, real drive, not only in the United States, but around the world, to bust open sort of the last uh, cloistered uh, secret areas in government has reached a plateau. And that we're finding that transparency without accountability systems built in uh, while the transparency is being created aren't necessarily going to create a better democratic practice. I mean, in fact, it can drive cynicism. And then when people know what exists and still the same behavior goes on and on. Um, then I written and interviewed a friend of mine who's a chief of staff, somebody I actually went to graduate school with, and I kept saying this question is, what kind of information do you need? And he said, stop. Stop with the information. <laughs> he said, quit sending me clickable links. I need experts in the room and the political incentive to use facts. So then you have another set of problems here, is that knowledge, and especially high quality knowledge that maybe has second and third order impacts, that is a complex problem, doesn't have a very effective political constituency. Um, it can't compete in the room with uh, what, what I like to call mass and money. That's uh, noise, the noise created by millions and millions of emails. And the statistic that uh, we love to, to look at on this problem is that members of Congress's offices have experienced from 200 to 1,000% more incoming contacts from the outside world because of email over the last 10 years. They simply can't handle it. And so what's happened there is this sort of siege mentality. Relationships become more important than ever because what they're looking for are familiar filters and high quality um, information through people they can trust. So in many cases, I think what we're going to have is a rebolstering and a reconfiguration of, again, relationship-based influence on Capitol Hill. The problem there uh, is that the people who, who know that very, very well are part of what I'm calling uh, the wicked problem. And the paper, Congress's Wicked Problem, is available outside if you'd like to see it. Is, is, um, it's the self-reinforcing problem where it's 
uh, these very lucrative special interests on K Street and elsewhere who aren't doing anything and nefarious. I mean, their rights to petition Congress is guaranteed in that Constitution, but they're really sometimes the only ones in the room giving you actionable knowledge. And so you go with it because they're looking for a triage system. They're looking for decision rules. They're looking for filters. And the people sort of with the common good big picture agenda are either uh, just stuck in this sort of noise making machine uh, and they're not in the room with the expert knowledge when you need them. So something that really clicked in my head and the other, my other favorite quote from this uh, set of interviews, and I probably did 85 at this point, starting to do them in the states and districts as well, was, um, listen, you think about it as an information cartel. Uh, information is like a, a commodity or a weapon. It's certainly not a public interest. And that should uh, make all of us stand up and, and sit back because whether or not you think Congress is venal and corrupt, um, I think that there's a better case to be made that Congress is obsolete and incapacitated. And that if we focus on the fact that it's obsolete and incapacitated and start to build a more, what I'm calling a symmetrical knowledge environment for it, one that means something to members because much of it is located in states and districts, then we have another, a completely redesigned, re-engineered playing field for high quality expert knowledge. Of course, knowledge is always going to be debatable. It's always going to be controversial. But really, the very, basic, uh, the very basics of filtering information through institutional experience or the wisdom of what's already happened, it's pretty basic and non-controversial. I mean, just members getting to know uh, if a bill that they're looking at was reintroduced, who, who, who are the stakeholders already in the House and Senate? Is it a staff person? Where, where are the knowledge sources? There, there's definitely sorting and filtering mechanisms coming into Congress right now, but a lot of them are dealing with the noise. I'll give you just some example, and they're listed in this paper. They really sort sentiment, not substance. So we have to start getting out of this whole notion of crowdsourcing and into what's a more helpful notion for governing, which is curation. And this sort of curated knowledge is, is what we need at this point because casting the net wide uh, it, it is not gonna work for us. It's too complicated, it's too much noise. And I think figuring out sort of what is this division of labor of participation for policymaking really is the next step in this open government movement and also the improvement of uh, participatory democracy. So the um, the paper I've written, too, is a backgrounder on what used to exist in Congress. Congress's wicked problem is that the, a wicked problem, just to define it, is, is a very complex problem with lots of moving parts. But the key is that the people causing it are also the ones that need to fix it. So that the agents of the problem are also the ones responsible for fixing the problem. And in this case, it's members of Congress and American citizens. So the, the second phase of this has been looking at the states, and this is where I found these uh, wonderful projects and the gentleman sitting um, on the dais is that they're already, the states are already coming up with some really interesting and, and hopeful sorting and filtering mechanisms for high quality knowledge and information. Um, and that my sense is that because these transparency rules, keep in mind, just came into effect when Mr. Boehner became the speaker, uh, is that we're just at the baby steps of figuring out what we can do now with all this transparency. If you look and root around in like the House Administration rules, the Ethics Committee, what you see is real inconsistency. You see an institution trying really hard to keep up. The rules on communication outward is where internet fits. But you've seen some sort of distortions of this, it seems to me. You've, you're seeing uh, committee websites being basically used as war rooms. A political war rooms instead of substantive help um, portals for the institution. Uh, I, there are no rules against that. Uh, and when you go in and you look and you say, oh, the violations of, of use of committee websites is under what's called the Franking Commission. <laughs> so you go, to, you go to the Franking Commission, which is who gets to use stamps to send mail, who pays for mail, leaving offices. It's very highly regulated because of the timing, you know, before an election, after election. Anyway, this stuff all makes sense, but it is complicated. There's not even a category for the internet on the Franking Commission website. So you have real disparity and unevenness in dealing with technology inside of Congress. Um, this, at the state level, what I'm looking at is, is A, how do we leverage these entities that are actually supposed to be producing knowledge on behalf of the public interest anyway? You know, the land-grant system, universities, community colleges. 
And I thought it was interesting is why, again, they have huge social capital because they're based on public goods, but they spend it terribly. And it's usually just because they have bad timing or they don't know how to get in the room or they think it's lobbying, which it's not. Um, is uh, I did a little bit of back of the envelope research and I looked at of the original Tea Party caucus and you know the Tea Party's known for sort of wanting to, to banish the, the public square and to cut spending a lot on any kind of, of public entities. Um, out of the original 60 Tea Party caucus members, almost 80% of them went either to a land grant or a public university flagship. Three of them went to community colleges. That's a huge piece of, of um, social capital to spend. Why aren't they becoming somehow the help system, the in-state uh, surrogate uh, rapid response knowledge teams? Why aren't they providing graduate students in accordance with that members committee assignments to help come up with witness research questions, super finding the people? That's the kind of thing we can do now with uh, technology. And so, um, you know, it's one thing for uh, people to deny, you know, a lot of evidence on something like climate. It's another thing if your alma mater wants to engage you back in the district on sort of global awareness. That, that happens very rarely and it happens even less in the district. And the other thing I'll close with this is that what I found in talking to member offices is that policy staff are migrating into districts. This is something that nobody really keeps track of, but I think it points to something really interesting, which is that globalization has caused a need, a constituent service need for complex policy thinkers. <laughs> I, and I find this out by accident because I do these interviews in the states and I'll get cards from the staff I talk to and, and you know, a handful of them are doing policy issues in the district. And if anybody who's worked on the Hill knows the huge division between state and district staff and DC staff is this is where the policy staff are and the district, but you also have legislative directors flying back consistently. And I don't, I mean, this is my hypothesis, but I really feel like globalization has caused a need for real subject matter expertise, substantive knowledge, and new kinds of knowledge sharing networks in the states. And what we're trying to do is identify those help them become uh, relevant and useful sooner rather than later and re-engineer the expert knowledge system for Capitol Hill so it's far more symmetrical across the board. Great. Well, I'm going to operate from right here. Good afternoon, uh, everyone. Thanks for joining us. And uh, I'm glad to be on this panel. And thanks to Laura Lai for including me in this significant discussion. My name is Ben Frakely. I'm recently retired Lieutenant General from the US Army. Last uh, March, I worked for President Crow out at Arizona State University, and I work uh, here in the McCain Institute uh, for International Leadership. And uh, so by way of background, I, as a young brigadier, I worked in the National Military Command Center where we received a little bit of information from time to time and had to make uh, judgments on that to the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, the Secretary of Defense, and the President. And then I commanded our forces in Afghanistan from 2006 to 2007 operating out of a joint operations center that received information from uh, around the world, from all our interagencies and, and from the military to visualize, think through, sort, and, and have to make decisions from a lot of different information in a rapid period. Uh, today I work at ASU advising President Crow on leadership initiatives and I work at the College of uh, Public Affairs. And in the McCain Institute, what we're focused on is international leadership in the area of security, um, economic opportunity, freedom, and human dignity at home and abroad. And with that, we're working on a project uh, building off of work that's done at Arizona State called a Decision Theater. The Decision Theater was applied locally to do some work on helping leaders visualize water policy and what to do with water in a constrained environment in Arizona and also to do urban planning with the placement of uh, different buildings and different designs in the Tempe and Phoenix area to be better informed about the placement and, and the growth of the urban environment. What we're focusing on now is a decision theater here in Washington, D.C. as a part, sponsored by ASU, but as a part of the McCain Institute to help policy leaders and to help the Congress and to help others. We know that people make decisions, but better informed people make better informed decisions, as Gary and Lorelai have both pointed out. And so what we're thinking about is uh, the richness of data that comes uh, through business models, through social media, through uh, YouTube, through various means, how that data is turned into information, how information is turned into knowledge, how knowledge is turned into understanding, 
And then from that understanding, decisions are better informed. And, and we look at evidence-based, which is the facts that we'd like to get at hand and, and push out the special interest or the emotion tied to it or perhaps uh, the money behind it to, to push an agenda and really get to the evidence-based facts, but then tie that also to expertise. And the expertise coming from experience and judgment. It's taken the 25-year-old staffer on the Hill that's got a lot of facts at hand and giving it to the member who's got a lot of experience and judgment in the policy arena and combining the two to get the decisions. So in the decision theater, what we're focused on is, is how do we visualize this knowledge first? How do we put it up for people to see it, really understand it? And then what is the impact of the knowledge that you're working with? How can you look at cause and effect? Sort of if-then work as you manipulate the data, interact with the data and the knowledge to, to push it around. And then what trades are associated? And what are the risks associated with those trades? If I put more money into secondary education, is that going to help more kids go to college? Or should I start with even early learning and, and start with young people? Or should I try to distribute scarce resources and education across all grades? And how well is that going to work? Sort of what Gary's done with crime in, in, uh, in, in Washington. So evidence-based applied to experience. How do you then do the trades and the risk analysis and then see and understand the complex relationships that are out there? More and more, we know that in this complex world we're in, there's a lot of networks engaged with it and single solutions don't work, but networks applied against networks and can help understand the complexity and help solve complex problems. So we hope to create networks that can feed the decision theater and, and, and have a richer content that leads to understanding, visualization, and, and then move to decisions. And once you make that decision, you go right back into a cycle where you dis, d assess that, the impact of that decision, and what's the second and third order effect, and where do you move forward from there. So in this complex world, we hope to assist through this decision technology uh, thinking and, and approaches both at the McCain Institute and at Arizona State. We look forward to a discussion with you about any of that. Thank you. Great. Thank you. I want to thank all three of you, actually, for, for bringing up some great ideas and, and for provoking what I hope will be a, a lively discussion. Um, so I want to turn to questions in just a minute and comments, but, but, but maybe first pose one myself. Um, you know, in listening to each of you, I was trying to sort out what, what kind of both what the problem is and what, and, and what we're trying to solve is. And, and I hear different things and I, and from each of you, and, and, but things that connect across each of you. Uh, or each of your presentations, and, and would be interested in how you react to each other, in a sense. And, and in particular, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to understand whether we should think of this as a demand side or a supply side challenge, or both, um, or a, um, a structures problem, which I think is Ben, what you're what you're talking about. That you know that th there are some supply side problems. I, mean, I mean, I think that the, the answer, in some sense, is going to be a both and, right? But but, but as you sort that out or kind of clarify it, um, you know, I, I hear what you're saying, Gary, it sounds almost too good to be true. Uh, you know, that, that, well, if we could just produce, compile all this research and produce it all, that there's, there's an, ac an appetite for it. But what's interesting, as you described it, I thought, and not knowing a lot about it, is that in Washington State there was a demand for it. Um, and, that they, that it was, and they actually created it. And, and now as you try to take it uh, to other states, it's pew that's going to try, to try to bring it in. Will there be that, that same demand? And, and what will it take to, to sort of generate um, that demand? Um, yeah. you, you might take it first. Well, I think the demand exists pretty much everywhere. I think the policymakers are almost uniformly frustrated by not having the knowledge that they want to have to make informed decisions. I mean, virtually all policymakers will want to do the right thing. So they bring their ideologies and experiences to it. But, but I think that the frustration that they have is what what really is going to help me make a better decision for the citizens that I represent. So I think that the demand is out there. I mean, we have had some interactions with almost every state in the last year and a half saying, hey, we've heard about this. Can you tell me more about it? Uh, but we also want to make sure that those linkages exist that, that, that Laura Lee talks about. Because I mean, it's not just a simple factor of if we, if we build this, it will come. You have to end up setting up an institutional structure in a state that, that, that deals with some of these, these challenges of, of bringing this information to people, getting them through the gatekeepers, getting the gatekeepers confidence in this, and also making it visually compelling so that people can understand this information when, when it comes to you. So uh, bringing this information to people is only part of the battle, and, and you have to view this holistically because it has to be something that 
that really provides good information, but also provides it in a way that is useful to the institutions that it, that it is, is coming to, and it's transparent enough that people will understand it, you know, and, and won't view it as something that is partisan, because you know, we're trying to keep this very nonpartisan and very objective, recognizing that, that then policymakers will bring everything else to the table, which are their ideologies, their district interests, you know, their own experiences. Uh, and what we're trying to do really is sort of, I think, raise the batting average of evidence. Uh, if you look out there now, batting average of evidence is probably, you know, 0. 050 on a good day. Uh, <laughs> Uh, we'd be happy if we can get it up to maybe 300. I mean, that, that means that a lot of times other factors will trump data and, and knowledge. But if you bat 300 long enough, you get in the Hall of Fame. And uh, we think that that is probably a good initial goal for, for doing this. Do we need to have a switch out real fast? OK. Um, I'll just answer that is, is that uh, it seems to me there's a couple of problems here is, is that, yes, uh, expertise, who's informing the influencers, is always going to be controversial and hard fought. Like when I worked in Congress, I was always amazed that the people with the best information always sort of sent me their dissertation six months after um, you know, the legislation passed through Congress. It was a timing problem. It wasn't a trusted relationship problem, and it wasn't a substance problem. So the transparency piece might really help solve that timing problem for high quality knowledge that's based also on relationships. The locational aspect of this, and when I say that, I mean this disaggregated system. I don't know what it's going to look like, and it's going to look different in every state because it has to have be, you know, grown locally. Um, I think we'll create an accountability system for uh, high quality, robust knowledge that doesn't exist right now. When I went down to Tempe to look at Decision Theater, I was loving it. Basically, what it is is seven simultaneous screens. Um, five of which have tabular data on things that impact water scarcity in Arizona. It could be the Colorado River flows, you know, the needs of Las Vegas, utilities, and, util and the, the evidence is utility bills. I mean, I don't know how much you can argue with some of this stuff. Uh, climate patterns. Um, and then what was lovely, and this is, again, real-time uh, trade-offs. It rarely happens for members of Congress. And, and Congress and politicians yeah. suffer from what? Uh, social psychologists called loss aversion, which is the willingness to, um, to, to sell off or abandon future gains to prevent immediate loss. This is very common. I mean, if we can do anything to bridge that gap and, and help people make the hard trade-offs up front, what you could see on the final screen were pictures of the trade-offs. And it was, you know, swimming pools and golf courses and uh, bathtubs and lawns downtown and, you, you know, just people living in a community. And so if you decide to do that, you know, you could tweak any number and it's on a matrix, so it switches everything. And you could see then, are we really going to trade off, you know, um, showers for swimming pools? Are we really going to trade off if, if the Colorado River goes down this low? That kind of real-time accountability system, I, I think, is the only way that high-quality knowledge will get some political chops. And again, it's about timing and it's about being in the room in a way that's useful. The other thing is just the capacity of visual data to tell a story in a matter of seconds is huge. And ask any you know, under 30 person uh, about the power of visual data. And we need to figure out ways to translate uh, you know, numbers into pictures. And keep in mind, and this is just a story I love from reading this book, um, something called like Leonardo's Laptop. I'm not remembering the name of it. But it talked about how when the printing press was uh, developed, you know, this is Gutenberg, hundreds of years ago, what happened was text become f became far cheaper than pictures to print. And so we went off on this, into this, you know, uh, centuries of using text instead of accompanying it with the picture because prior to that, it was Galileo's astronomical discourses. There was always a three-dimensional picture and a story underneath it. We have the chance as humans who crave visual stories to now put sort of both halves of our brain back together, as the way I like to think of it. You have the right brain and the left. You have the linear and the visual. That, to me, I think we have no idea what that might do for us, is to tell the story in a far more compelling, robust way up front. Politicians hardly ever get that opportunity. And, and you know, it creates an accountability mechanism. So, so your rea both of your answers sort of raise a question I want to put to Ben, I guess, which is, um, you know, one, on the one hand, it seems as if we do have a knowledge problem and an expert, expertise problem, an information problem. Um, but, but then we also have, in, in, in a lot of ways, a people problem. And, um, and that people, the people 
on the knowledge creating side, the suppliers, haven't adapted to changes in the way our society works and the way our institutions work. Um, and those on the demand side aren't capable, therefore, of figuring out how to interact with them in an effective way. The decision theater is intended to try to, in part at least, to bridge that, it seems like, as a, but I'm wondering how you think about what additional people we need to bring to the table, or, or how do we, it, it, you know, and this goes maybe in part to Lorelei's point of sort of, well, if we could only leverage the resources of the land-grant institutions. And as a former college professor, I, I think about my colleagues and I think, <laughs> It's not going to happen, right? The, you know, n even if you get them to do something more, it isn't going to be what you're talking about. Right. It isn't going to be, it, and you're trying to do this at ASU, it seems right. to me. And so I just wondered if you could speak to that a bit. Well, um, first, to go to your first question that you asked Lorelei and Gary about what's the problem, the, the question really is, are our policymakers uh, making the best decisions they can? And we see in business that many people who have organized information have applied metrics have a system in place, make very good decisions, and businesses flourish when they have that kind of information. With what we're trying to do is in this uh, data-rich environment that comes from everywhere, it's not just one printing press producing one document, but it's many talking to many simultaneously, is how do you harness this, this knowledge? How do you get the universities and other areas of expertise to, to, to some of the work that you've done about the old think tanks that were really just think tank, really great folks who did great analysis. How do you reach into those that are doing great analysis and bring the vision, cut through the clutter, because we're filled in this world today with all the clutter and the noise. How do you cut through it and harness that and, and, and put this in context so data to information, information to knowledge. Uh, now in the academic setting, you've got to find folks that are passionate about the same passions and you've got to also help um, you know, some people say, well, how does the military rapidly organize so much information to a rapid output? Part of that is standardization. But you have to be a little careful in that um, over-standardization just crushes innovation. But innovation without any standardization is sort of anarchy. <laughs> so you kind of want a sweet spot, it seems to me, in between. You want to get these great brains across our country engaged in the dialogue, doing the, someone else can possibly do the fact work. When I talked about the, adding the experiential layer, the expertise level. Mm -hmm. you, you want folks who get this depth and this huge ball of knowledge who look at it as Gary's guys are doing at Pew and cutting through it and say, this is what really works. This is what doesn't work and here's the trade. So I, I think we have to look out across America at all the places where knowledge exists, where analysts exist and harness that power. And that's what we're trying to do through uh, decision theater. Let me start opening it up for questions and comments. If, yeah. And I may, oh, we do have a microphone. Yeah, I also just want to recognize Xander, who's at the Sunlight Foundation, who agreed to come down here and help us today. Sunlight, which is another wonderful resource in this realm. Hi, this question is for Lorelei. I'm Loretta Goodwin from the American Youth Policy Forum. And I wondered if you could talk a little bit more about the timing issue. And you talked about the dissertation arriving, you know, six months down the road. And I was wondering about the need for knowledge in time and where the onus is on both reaching out for that knowledge and also the knowledge coming in. So I wondered if you could talk a little bit about that. Sure. Um, one of the the... One of the things I realized actually lately, I went up and talked to the ethics staff, is I didn't realize that there are actual certain restrictions on what members of Congress can ask for from their constituents because they err on the side of caution a lot not to create conflicts of interest. And what ends up happening is this chill effect. So nobody talks to anybody because they're afraid they're going to do something wrong. Well, the, I think this has, has hurt uh, this knowledge sharing quite a bit um, because it just makes it more difficult. My sense is that. Um, there's some simple steps forward that, for example, to create more symmetry of access to high quality vetted information, for example, between committees and personal staffs. On the Hill, committees are just, they're the well-fed, um, the, 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 the people who get all the trips, who get all the visits from the people coming, all the Aspen you know, study groups. And hardly anybody does this kind of same care and feeding for personal staffs. Yet the personal staffs where the member who's going to write the speeches for the member, who's very often going to do the, what I, you know, I guess you call shotgun work, which happens at the last minute. Uh, there also needs to be more symmetry between policy staff and the communication staff on the Hill. So it's creating, like we experiment with this a couple years ago with something called the Afghanistan Congressional Communications Hub. 
which was simply trying to even out the, the knowledge available about civilian engagement in Afghanistan, because you had the military repeatedly testifying that there was no military solution and that they needed some kind of way to uh, build social resilience in Afghanistan. But Congress kept basically throwing troops at the problem. I mean, they did fund a lot of, of non-military stuff. But the problem there was that pretty soon you had the Armed Services Committee uh, writing the civilian benchmark language. That, just, that shouldn't happen. It's a, it's a problem of obsolescence in the institution that it doesn't share knowledge that's of general concern. Why can't uh, a, a, a university out there across the country that has a bunch of returned um, National Guard and a couple of retired officers plus a, a lot of people maybe who have familiarity with Afghanistan build some kind of a knowledge hub that bridges that gap between committees and personal staffs? This is what one staff person said. Um, we, we, we need an eBay of expert knowledge for Congress. <laughs> Um, not like a, another Sotheby's or another like high-end retail auction house. We need something that's matchable by location, where it matters, when it matters. That the person on the user end gets to control. I guess it doesn't seem to me to be too much to ask of the academic community in this country, and I came out of an academic setting as well, uh, to please step up and help these institutions evolve. We need it so badly, and there's a unique and indispensable role for people who are looked um, at as experts um, to help, help on this front right now. What about dedicating a team of grad students? What about dedicating what we're calling knowledge fellows to district offices, where some of their job is simply inventorying the expertise available in the member's district? Uh, this is the kind of way that you cut through the noise. Um, they're already doing, they're right now they're sorting with, with uh, area codes and zip codes. That's still, it's not very useful when you have a real precise question about girls' education in Afghanistan, right? There are ways we can do this. This is a hard problem. It is not an impossible problem. And for me, too, I grew up, in, or I was born in San Jose. I came here from Silicon Valley. I want Silicon Valley to step up and start, you know, like letting go of this sort of libertarian dream world that's furnished by apps for everything. That's not going to happen with our governing institutions. It's not going to work. There is no app for Congress. There is no app for the executive branch. <laughs> um, we need to figure out this problem, and it's a perfect one for people who think in systems, which is 70% of the people who live out there. It seems to me that de dealing with, with academic institutions is, is really an interesting issue because, I mean, on one hand, academic institutions have a huge amount of ex expert knowledge. On the other hand, they are incredibly siloed. All of the academic it, incentives for faculty are to hoard institutional knowledge because what you're based on for your tenure decisions is how much you're going to publish. Teaching is factored into that. You know, sharing your, your experience with Congress, not at all. If, if people would probably advise you against it. So I really think that there needs to be a couple of institutions, Arizona State and others, who really find a way to do this and are the innovators in doing this. Because if someone has to do this, I mean, we're not going to have more expert knowledge in the future or n more expert resources than we have now. I mean, it's, there just isn't going to be more money for this stuff. So we have to deploy the information we have much more effectively, and that's going to require you know, looking at the, the incentive structures we have, you know, building the network solutions that we need to have because you know, Congress and all political institutions are very highly networked, and we're really having a way of, of bringing this information together in ways that are useful and usable. And, We've got a ways to go on that. Can, I just make a quick comment that, that President Crow is focusing the university on what he calls inspired use research. So if the research isn't really going to be usable, then they're not really underwriting the research that's ongoing. And just on the timing piece, I think it's so important that as fast as cycles of information are flowing now, that leaders have to really stipulate when they need information by. And that takes some of their work to envision what's up in front of them, what policies they need to make by when, and, and help in, in, inform those who are making policy or contributing to policy on when decisions are needed by. Because as Lorelei says, you know, to have information six months later, thank you, but it's going to be a great historical record, but it didn't inform the policy when it was needed. So leaders really have to stipulate when it's needed, or rules have to change to, to help move information faster. And Gary, just if you could quickly, along the lines of the conversation we're having, can you say a little more about the mechanics of how your project works in terms of who who brings the information forward? Who makes sure that the information is available at a time that's useful for the decision makers? Well, in, 
terms of pulling the information together, right now we're, we're working with the Institute in Washington State who's developed this approach, and, and they're combing through the published research, uh, but both you know, the, the journey, uh, journal articles, as well as information that's available on their website. But, but you know, to us, the, the exciting thing is that we know that, that states have a lot of research that's never been published. Some of it is very good research. So as we're getting into more states, then we think we'll be able to share that information more. But you know, in, in our work, you know, that that's only part of the solution. The other solution really is to you know, take that package information and then build a structure within a state that is very responsive to policymakers, can provide this information in, in a way that is useful to them, but within the time periods that they need it on. Because you can't tell a policymaker yeah, give me six months for that decision I, need, I know you need to make tomorrow and I'll get you something. I mean, you, even if it's not perfect information, it's still much better than what they're basing it on now, which is you know, you know, information, facts, distraction, distortions, and everything else that's out there. So. Or turning to the intern sitting next to you and saying, what do you know about I mean, the nonproliferation treaty? <laughs> <laughs> but that's exactly what happens in Hill offices. <laughs> Sorry, it's scary, I know. And we'll turn it back to, to another question, but Ben, just quickly, how, with respect to the decision theater, the same question, I guess, how you're going to kind of deploy it or, you know, optimally, I guess, you'd want policymakers to sort of say, look, we need to figure out a, a place to go to sort these issues out and, and that they could come and convene a session there, but is that well, right? Or? We're going to uh, begin with an excursion with the Congo and, and look at the issues uh, associated with the Congo. And the way in which we're getting the information is we're actually uh, having a class at ASU uh, for credit uh, constructed, a policy design class where the students are going to learn about developing policy, how do you formulate policy, but they're going to collect information on the Congo in, in a lot of different areas and proliferate our databases with the information they can find, sort of what the Washington Institute is, that what you guys, is doing for, for uh, the uh, legal system. And so. We will look to see how that operates, but we'll also look to see where other places of expert knowledge res reside about the Congo, non-governmental organizations, uh, 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 you know, Doctors Without Borders or whomever who's in there that has information that they want to share about what they're observing that's happening in the Congo. And so we, we want to have a layer of information, say uh, it's, it's uh, geospatial type information that's reusable, but as others have problems they want to deal with, they can come and layer in their information on top of that and we can make it cost effective for policy leaders to use it over and over again. If each excursion is prohibitively expensive, it'll be a short-term decision theater because it'll, as, as Gary says, our resources are coming down, so we have to figure out ways to do things more economically and move information easier for, for people to use. But we're gonna do it through uh, using the students and the faculty at ASU to populate what we know about the Congo and expand on that. Laurel, I, I really liked the, your report that I was in before the 1995 change of rules and saw a Congress at a time that saw the value of shared information, of having information available with, without trying to control it. Since that time, we've seen much more having a, almost a, well, I'll say a military approach to saying we want to get here what do we need to do to get this policy implemented? And if it means ignoring certain information, it gets ignored. You point out that a lot of that is done through rules of what can be funded, uh, what organizations can have staff, who they can talk to. Right. In effect, I think all of you are talking about waging a guerrilla war against this existing structure. Is that feasible, or do the people making the, the policy decisions, who, who well understand that you might be a threat to particular policy objectives. Can you, can you win that war? Well, from my perspective, uh, leading 26 nations called NATO in Afghanistan is really hard to get consensus. And then when you ask the Pakistanis to come to the party and uh, you bring in the different elements of our own government, USAID, uh, Department of Agriculture, and, and uh, state and others, um, getting consensus is really hard. But when we operated in uh, the Joint Operations Center and laid out visually the trades and, and what we were trying to do and where we were trying to go, we got a motion out of it and we got agendas, uh, either NATO personal country agendas and caveats, we got that out of the way. We got consensus around the table and moving forward based on facts, uh, not based on any other, any other thing. So at least if you can start with facts, if you can start with good information, 
that Gary keeps bringing us back to, at least you, you have a fairly firm footing and hope to move forward in a uh, consensus manner. Short of that, you're just going to be fighting over either agendas or uh, evidence that's produced by the lobby group that you paid for to have to do the work or however it gets to you. So I think if you start with facts and, and you start with visualization and you bring every, you have a transparency where everyone's brought to the table, where uh, information is not a commodity but information is shared and it's available to all, I think that starts moving you in the right direction. Will we still be seen as a threat? Probably, but uh, that's not our intent. Our intent is to have a safe place uh, to have informed decision making take place based on evidence and experience. Yeah, I understand where you're coming from, but I don't think that what we're trying to do is sort of a guerrilla war against the institutions. I think it's equipping the institutions to do what they are designed to do, but to do it in a fundamentally better way by providing them with answers to questions that they have to deal with. I mean, because every legislature has appropriations staff whose job it is to try to inform members' decisions about, well, what should we do in the criminal justice budget? What should we do in the early education budget? But you know, those staff don't have a lot of you know, ability to go out there and research you know, different alternatives that they could bring before members. So if we can bring that together and build that into the process that, that already exists there, strengthening it at times, but also just providing them with better tools to do the job that, that you know, needs to be done and is being done, then I think we can get by without you know, exacerbating the political conflicts that are there. I mean, th those conflicts will continue to exist. Members will make decisions for other reasons than this data. And there may be some folks who are threatened because they will view it that, well, this information shows that my program stinks, but you know, I would still like to get funding for it. So you, know, you will still have battles over information, but I, I think that if you do it in a way that is transparent uh, and is based on very sound principles, then it becomes hard to refute. Um, I would just say that I, I, another hypothesis that I think was at least partly borne out last night is I think we've reached in our political system, but especially in our institutions, and especially in Congress, that we've reached the point of diminished returns where money and noise are concerned. Um, that the point of diminished returns is a great economics term actually. It took me 20 years after I took Economics 101 to actually understand what it meant in politics is that it's the point where one more of anything is counterproductive. It's not getting you anything extra. And I know it's oversimplification to say uh, that all this m anonymous money from the super PACs um, you know, was worthless. I, I know that's not true because there's a lot more complexity. There's down ballot races. There's a lot more out there than the president's race. But I, if it makes the point that, listen, there is a lot more subtlety and a lot more uh, leverage, uh, influence leverage that we've hardly accounted for. And one of them is, again, how do you spend high quality social good relationships? The, the other piece of this that I think is really important, so we see like money's reached its, its maximum saturation point perhaps, is that um, social media is in the sort of dream world and I'm sounding like a cranky Hill staffer here. If you think like Coney 2012 is going to get you helicopters in the Sudan for peacekeeping missions, um, or if you think simply passing an act to feed the maw of the anti or the genocide intervention movement or, or whatever movement is out there, it, these people cannot hear this. The Sopa Pipa fight last January, I think, is a good object lesson. How many times are you really going to shut down the internet to get what you want? Um, are you going to maybe make sure sometime that there are technologists in the room when the legislation is being written? So it's again, it's, it's sort of the, it's the supply chain management problem of knowledge within the process of policy. This is a much harder problem. But you know, if you're looking at legislation, SOPA people went down hard. Uh, it looked really, really pretty seamy that just one narrow slice of interest was very represented in the legislation. But within a couple months, a bill passed with a national security label slapped on it. I think it was called CISPA, which actually eliminated um, Freedom of Information re Act requests. And I, I think in, in other ways was more egregious uh, and very damaging. So again, it's this problem of having standing support accountability systems for using expert knowledge. Um, and and we have to figure this out. Like, around the world, we're not a unique case. Citizens' expectations for meaningful participation in their shared future has far outpaced government's ability to provide for that. Far outpaced. You have Iceland recently, which sort of curated a new constitution with a lot of 
participation. You have Dartmouth College doing the sort of uh, comparative analysis for the Vermont and New Hampshire legislatures. You have Washington State, the institution he was referring to, I think was created by the legislature itself, wasn't it? And, and the other thing was about the Office of Technology Assessment. It was so interesting is because they didn't work on a problem unless a Democrat and a Republican shepherded it through. That's not true of the other support agencies today. So you can build in empathy and bipartisanship and how knowledge provision is structured to share. And that's what we're not doing very well. So this stuff isn't rocket science, but it is complicated. And we've done it already. Thank you. Question in the back. This is a good segue, um, Laura. Like uh, this question you sort of begin to address in your paper. Just about every state and the um, U.S. Congress have access to nonpartisan legislative research organization that was set up just for this purpose, to have analysts at hand who are policy experts and who know about the timing as well. And um, obviously, they're not working out. They're, they're in Congress, they rarely seem to be the primary source of information uh, for members' offices or for committees. Why would any of these new efforts be different, or what do we need to do differently to make uh, the dream of this sort of nonpartisan, uh, effective policy um, body really be used as it's intended to be used? I think you should, you should answer because you've had such incredible experience in person. You're totally right that almost every state has a legislative research office that it's created to do research and to do evaluations and do policy analysis. Uh, it, there's several challenges with them. One is it, it's a normative institutional challenge. It, when these offices were set up, when that field was set up, this was back, really, most of those offices were created back in the 60s and 70s. Uh, and we were still really in kind of a positivist perspective uh, you know, as those norms of those offices were being set up. Uh, and so a lot of them have a very strong institutional norm of independence. And uh, on one hand, that is you know, laudatory because they want to provide objective information. On the other hand, if they're not networked into their own legislature, then their information isn't going to go anyplace. And that's a huge problem for a lot of those offices. So you know, the, the question that as we're going into states is to recognize what resources are there, but to put you know, the tools that we're developing into the process frequently in a different place. Now, now some of those offices are, are working with us because they work well with the process. For example, in New Mexico, the Legislative uh, Research and Evaluation Unit is part of the Appropriations Committee, uh, which basically guarantees that their work is going to be highly focused on things that matter because that's what they're doing. In other offices, in other states, those offices are sort of off to the side and you know, that they do great work. Some of it has impact, but it's not really where we view you know, this work should be for, for what we're trying to do. Uh, you know, I, in an ideal world, you'd go back and retool some of those, those arrangements. Uh, that's not something I want to spend my time doing with this because that's a, a bigger and long-term challenge. I, I think we have to be mindful of the challenges that, that are out there. I think that there are some great examples where states have come up with institutional arrangements that are very functional. And what we're trying to do is replicate those successes and, and move forward on that. And if we can drag the rest of the field along behind us, uh, all the better. So. Could you maybe say a word about a place, a state that's doing this well or where the institutional arrangements work? Because this is a concern I've had looking around the country and, and looking at Washington as well. And I, as some, now, having left academia, I run a, a, a small uh, Truman Scholarship Foundation which supports young people committed to public service. And it's been interesting to watch how those who are committed to public service perceive what public, good public service might be and where it is they're interested in going and working. And they're not interested in going and working working in the kinds of agencies that provide expertise and information. Um, they don't, it doesn't seem to be highly valued. It doesn't seem to be something that provides kind of useful career trajectories for them. They're not sure where it's going to lead. And since nobody's using that work anyway, um, why would they go kind of bang their head against the wall? And, and so th as, as a consequence, I, I, I don't know if that is replicated across the country, but there's a worry of are we getting good, good people in these agencies? Can we attract them? Um, or are they kind of in Lorelei's uh, Lorelei's uh, language kind of antiquated. If you talk to people coming out of school, the, the one thing that I think is universal is they want to make a difference. Uh, so so I, I think that the hunger, 
among people coming out of schools, really good schools, really good students coming out of them, is they want to work someplace that, that makes a difference. So I, I think our challenge in designing institutions is to make sure that our institutions are actually doing that, that, that they are making a difference. And you know, I think as Laura Lee has found, I mean, many of our institutions of governance are hugely dysfunctional, uh, that they were based on, you know, you know, an institutional structure that made sense in the 1700s or the 1800s or the 1940s or the 1960s, but, you know, we're living in a different age now. Knowledge is everywhere. The problem of expert, you know, use of information is huge. I think it's up to us and anyone running an institution to come up with a way that, that our institutions function much better. Uh, and in terms of places that, that we're working at that I think work well. I mean, we're, we're currently we're working in 12 states, and uh, of those states, I, I put them in sort of two boxes. One is that we're working sort of with the executive branch to, to get this operational, and the advantage is, is that they have the data, and they, they know their data, and it, it, it's technically easier to implement the model because they know the data. The challenge is getting those, those offices to network with the legislature in, in a functional way. In the other half of the states, we're working much more with the policy side of the world. Uh, and New Mexico is a great example of that. I mean, we're working directly with the Appropriations Committee and the research staff who are assigned with that committee, and they're doing great work. I mean, it's in some of the states we're working on, it's taken those states a year to get the model initially up and running. New Mexico did it in about four months. Uh, and they've already issued two reports based on it, and they're already making you know, changes based on it because they understand that the questions that their members have and the they're tying this work directly to the process. Uh, so our, our lessons learned is it, it's really important where you put something like this to make sure that those network linkages are, are there from the beginning because it's incredibly hard to create them if they're not there. So you know, I, I think those offices are there. I, I think they, they, they do good work. I, I think that they face some challenges and it's a resource that is there. It's a resource that needs to be used more than it is. Uh, there's some challenges, but I am optimistic. So. I would also point out just that a lot of people don't realize that who initiates information or knowledge sharing um, in Congress is a huge issue. I've all, I often notice I've worked with the military for so long is the military is not going to ever initiate a huge uh, public uh, you know, education campaign on behalf of Congress, yet they have some probably the best uh, experiential memory of the last 20 years in foreign policy. And so we have to figure out ways that people who can initiate do. And this is, you know, citizens who live in your district who are experts. Like, we need to figure out how, th how to help them self-organize. Um, nothing is going to sort of make it in politics in the end, as you know, unless it deals with turf and ego. Um, and how do you make knowledge uh, fit into that or make it more alluring and make institutions more sexy? Um, one of the things I've found uh, as the uh, kind of resident old person in the Open Technology <laughs> Institute where I work, I'm about 15 years older than most of the staff, is that this realm that needs to come together and figure out this problem is populated, which w just to pick a good metaphor, is sort of the, the Jedis and the Yodas and not the Jedi Knights. And the Jedi Knights are the people who are, might be retiring another five to ten years who are immersed in these institutions in their height of dysfunction. And that we need to figure out how to get them in the room so they get some empathy for each other. That like, I would like an app, but maybe I just need a basic human resources sorting app, not a fabulous, you know, inversion boots mechanism that also, it just, I'm, I'm making fun of my colleagues. <laughs> but the wonderful, the wonderful potential if, the, if, the, if these things meet somehow in a more balanced way. All this information, all the social media is not going to make a huge uh, difference in the end unless there's an organization behind it. I think that's one of the things we're finding is that it's still going to take the same old um, political organization based on social networks and who you're talking to and accountability. And the other thing I'd point out is um, that members are home in their districts, I guess, 10 to 13 weeks more now than they were two years ago. That's an, an, a huge, huge opportunity to do new things with them. And, and very few offices that I've talked to say that any kind of knowledge opportunities are presented to them, something that's useful for them. As somebody just coming in and saying, this is what we have available to you. There's only two offices, I think, out of 80 interviews that said their university system and their experts are really set up to help them when they need it.
That's, that surprised me. I thought that would be a far, far more healthy mutual relationship. We have time for a couple of more questions if, if they exist. Well, maybe I'll pose one then to kind of to kind of close with, and 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 it, and it builds on what you were just saying, Lorelai. Um, could you just say a bit more about who these knowledge brokers should be, or the kind of um, uh, the folks who are going to um, curate knowledge, um, where we should look for them, and then and a bit more about how how we should see a use for technology in in making this all possible. I think that. Uh, Knowledge brokers, um, in, the, in the institutional sense, I think there's a way to help think tanks. This is the, you know, the, the center of the universe where knowledge ecosystem is Washington, D.C., right? We have a, an infrastructure here of think tanks, uh, boutique issues, big issues, anything you can imagine that doesn't exist anywhere else in the world. I think we need to evolve a system where the think tanks are much more nodes. They're the proximate nodes for a, a system that's out around the country because being proximate to Congress is always going to have benefits, right? We can run up there in, 30, you know, in 20 minutes um, and somehow coordinate that so that the members have both sort of a, tr a set of trusted, vetted relationships here by topic, by issue. Uh, and you also have the, the turf issue taken care of, which is this is also connected somehow to my uh, constituents. This is somehow connected back. One of the things that came up over and over again, and I'll write this up in another paper uh, in the next few months, is um, the, what these staff are asking for is really pretty simple, and some of it is very technologically available with things like simple wikis. Right now, members not only need to um, uh, deal with traditional press, broadcast media, the, the one to many, but they're needing to deal with like uh, micromedia, hyperlocal news. Something people ask for repeatedly was simple um, press lists of bloggers and tweeters in my district and sorting their blogs and posts and tweets into a press clippings for micromedia. Now this is the kind of thing that might make your head explode, but it's, it's very doable. Um, and what I would argue, and this could be contributed to, to the state level, there could be different levels of access, uh, there could be a public facing, um, but I do also think there needs to be, again, not all information is created equally, and even Wikipedia right now is having to deal with uh, their editing process being gamed by people who can afford to hire people to go in and change entries all the time. This is going to be um, a, an ongoing problem is that if you can game the noise or game the, the participation with money. Uh, my sense, and I'm going to just be a complete purist on this, is there can be no money involved. We have to get the money out. There can't be a compromise on that. This has to be people, maybe a group of foreign service officers who set themselves up to be your sort of rapid response situational awareness team. Uh, it has to be transparent, who's making money off of something or not. I mean, just that alone, I think, would be really helpful. Well, the stakes are too high for it to be gamed like that on a lot of these issues. I mean, the fact that, like, you know, the START Treaty two years ago really shocked me was held hostage to tax cuts and unemployment benefits, I thought was sort of the, <laughs> like, how could we get to this place where nothing is transcendent anymore? And I think you just, we have to take some hard stands where, you know, we're in a world of social capital now. We're going to spend relationships, not money. Money has reached its point of diminished return. It is hurting us badly. We need to get it out and figure out how to start again. And I have a friend that I taught peace studies with at Stanford who said he's a pacifist, not because he doesn't want to, you know, shoot people's heads off, but because it makes him be creative. Same with vegans that I know. It forces you to figure out different things. And we have to figure out a way where politicians see their successful future embedded in the destiny of the people they disagree with. That's the only way this is going to work. And people just need to start standing up for the public interest. Why is it that the only federal institution that really feels comfortable talking about teamwork is in uniform? That's just not a healthy place to be as a democracy. These kinds of things, adapting the lessons of the military into the civilian world is another huge challenge for us because they have so much experience on creating resilient societies. Um, all of that. Anyway, not to, to go on, but there's, there's a huge amount of political capital to be built here, I think, if we think creatively. Great. It's a good note to end on. I want to thank Lorelei, first off, for an excellent paper and for organizing this, and, and Gary pleasure. and Ben for being part of it. And thank you all for being here. Have a good afternoon. Thank you.